All right, love for you to uh, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. And we come this evening to really the bedrock text in our Bibles of predictive prophecy. Because if we understand this text and we take its meaning at face value, we will discover very precise details about Messiah's first coming and his second coming and the events leading up to each. And there is exquisite detail here in four verses that lays the framework for the rest of our Bibles. And you have to understand that the overarching theme of the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. There is only one God. He is the God of Israel and he is absolutely in charge of all things. History is his story. And I believe there's no greater proof to God's absolute sovereignty, not only over the big picture, but over the minutia of human events than predictive prophecy. Because God can say exactly what will happen and then it happens. This is one of the great testimonies to the fact that the Bible that we hold in our hands is in fact the breathed out word of God. God knows the future because he already wrote the future. And so his integrity is at stake and his ability to maintain and fulfill predictive prophecy. And so we shouldn't have a, a qualm with God telling the future. Although I will confess to you that eschatology is something of a debated subject. And it can at times tend to distract or even divide Christians. Uh, there are some perhaps who think of eschatology too much and work out things between the white spaces in Scripture and come up with their schemes and tie their name to their scheme, and that's all they ever want to speak of. And, and there are others who, afraid of such things, don't want to talk about eschatology at all. And I think there are times where, uh, in the Christian life, we gravitate to certain heroes, and we can gravitate to their systems or their abhorrence for systems. And what we need to do, fundamentally, is listen to God's word. And I would suggest that a rigid holding to a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic in the four verses we'll look at tonight will present details from predictive prophecy that overhauls eschatological systems. There's no two ways about it in Daniel chapter 9. And yet, we must listen to God's word. We must let God's word speak. So just by way of encouragement, I'm going to quote a little Spurgeon for us to get us started this evening. I don't have any illustrations tonight. The text is so illustrative, and I used all my illustrations this morning. So no illustrations. You're going to have to put on your seatbelt, listen fast. This is just an hour's worth of exegetical details. But we'll start with some Spurgeon. Spurgeon, early in life, considered eschatology unimportant. Um, he kind of... Uh, downplayed the need to talk about eschatology, was turned off by people who talked about eschatology all the time. Later in life, he went on to say that eschatology was, in fact, supremely important. In a sermon entitled, He Comes on the Clouds, near the end of his ministry, Spurgeon said this, Brethren, no truth ought to be more frequently proclaimed next to the first coming of the Lord than his second coming. And you cannot thoroughly set forth all the ends and bearings of the first advent if you forget the second. All of the prophets say he will come. If he came to die, doubt not that he will come to reign. And if he came to be despised and rejected of men, why should we doubt that he will come to be admired in all them that believe? In a May 5th, 1861 sermon on the premillennial return of Christ, Spurgeon said this, Sometimes we read scripture, think of what it ought to say, rather than what it does say. And he went on in this sermon to detail the fact that Revelation chapter 20 clearly teaches that the saints will reign with Christ on this earth for a thousand years before the new heavens and new earth. And that we must preach the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. And that we will be blessed whenever we do. And the text of scripture describes it. When, when the Bible itself comes to the details and the events of the millennial kingdom, we must preach it. And he went on to say, if we, we will have the withdrawing of God's blessing if we do not preach it from Scripture. And then he detailed some practical implications of that doctrine for believers. 
Another historical hero of mine is John Owen. And John Owen has written a monumental, multi-volume commentary on the book of Hebrews. It's so large, in fact, that the introduction takes up the first two volumes. And on page 356 of volume one, in the introduction to his commentary in the book of Hebrews, John Owen makes this argument. And, And he's writing in the 1600s. And keep in mind, 1600s A.D. happens before uh, British Zionist movements and the Balfour Declaration. It happens before uh, the, the surge of Jews heading back into Palestine and certainly happens before 1948 and modern Israeli statehood. This is the 1600s. And John Owen says this, The fact that God has not given Jews repentance means that his covenant with them is broken. And 1,600 years proves that their special relationship to God is over. That's John Owen's argument. Now, a couple hundred years later, J.C. Ryle writes on the same topic with a different take. And J.C. Ryle still writes before British Zionism and the Balfour Declaration and 1948 Israeli statehood. And in his book, Are You Ready for the End of Time?, J.C. Ryle makes the argument that if God made promises to ethnic national Israel, he will keep them. You say there is no Israel today? God will still keep his promises. He'll raise them up, bring them back, and keep his promises. Those are two sort of divergent takes on current events related to eschatology. But I would contend with you that one of them is rooted in the scriptures and actually takes the scriptures at face value and believes them contrary to appearances in current events. And my friends, that is the stance we need to take. Don't get your eschatology from the newspaper headlines. Um, You'll start finding the mark of the beast in every new credit card that comes in your mailbox. Don't do that. Uh, Don't date the return of Christ. You cannot do that. That would be unbiblical at this point in salvation history. Uh, We don't want to give more space and more weight to eschatological frivolity then the text of Scripture would warrant us to look at end times. Let me give you a passage just to warm us up for Daniel 9 a little bit. Look at Isaiah 46. God makes promises regarding Israel throughout the Old Testament. And perhaps it's helpful to be in the habit of noticing a verse in my Bible that seems to be yet unfulfilled. What should our flinch response be? God, you will keep this promise. I don't know when. So I just write when with a question mark in the margin when I see something that God said he would do that hasn't happened yet in history. I want you to see Isaiah 46, 1 to 4. Bell has bowed down. Nebo stoops over. Their images are consigned to the beasts and the cattle. The things that you carry are burdensome, a load for the weary beast. They stooped over. They have bowed down together. They could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you, and I will bear you, and I will deliver you. And this is a remarkable set of contrasts in these four verses. What are idols? Man-made images. They don't do anything. They have to actually be carried And so the people who worship idols have to come up with contrivances to carry them, wagons and carts and other things. And these idols themselves that do nothing, they speak nothing, they provide nothing, they are emptinesses. In fact, the Hebrew word havel for vanity, chasing after the wind, is the same word used of idols in the prophets. They are nothings, and they leave you with nothing, but they have to be carried, so they're a burden. And then God changes the image in verse, 30, in verse 3, listen to me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel, you who have been born by me from birth. So your idols, your emptinesses are a burden to you and Israel 
You've been a burden to me. I'm carrying you around in your rebellion. And you're wearying yourself, chasing things that cannot satisfy. And I've carried you. And then God says, and I will carry you. I will deliver you. I will rescue you. What is that promise from Isaiah 46? In spite of Israel's idolatry, in spite of Israel's rebellion, God does not say, Israel rebelled, done with you, going on to the Gentiles. God will keep his promises. The question is not if, but when and how. How will God bear up his people and maintain fidelity to his own promises? What we have in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, is an answer to the question, how will God do this? Daniel 9, 24 to 27, this bedrock passage for predictive prophecy is God's help for Israel. This follows Daniel's prayer. We've been looking at, looking at that over the past weeks. And the people of Israel are in exile. According to Jeremiah 25, 12 and 29, 10, they are there because they forsook the Lord. They are there because they forsook the Lord, particularly related to obedience to God. They rejected him for idols. One of the manifestations of their disobedience was not following the Sabbath year regulations for the land. Second Chronicles tells us this is exactly why they're in the land. They were removed from the land for their failure to observe Sabbath rests. Daniel has been praying in Daniel chapter 9 for the sins of his people. He knows that if they disobeyed 490 years of Sabbath land resting, that was going to equate to 70 years of exile in Babylon. Daniel's looking at his watch. The time is almost up. And so Daniel senses the spiritual state of the people. Have they really turned back to Yahweh from idolatry, from the heart? Are we prepared spiritually to inherit the blessings in the land? And Gabriel comes with the answer to Daniel's prayer. Out of the 800 years they were in the land, apparently 490 of them were in disobedience to this specific command. Israel had missed 70 sets of seven-year sabbatical land rest, so God would make the land rest. Daniel, I believe, was expecting, at the return from exile, a spiritual repentance, a national spiritual repentance, bringing in a time of blessing, maybe even the messianic era. And we've seen how Daniel has woven together the Deuteronomic blessings and the promises and threatenings from the prophets that said, you've forgotten your end of the covenant. He's appealed to all of those things in his prayer. Gabriel the angel comes to Daniel, answers the prayer, and then gives him the interpretation. How will God help Israel? First of all, this evening, if you're following an outline, we'll see God's sixfold purpose for Israel and Jerusalem. This is in verse 24. We'll read each verse one at a time and walk our way through it. Look at verse 24 with me. Seventy sevens have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. The first part of God's help is this sixfold purpose. And notice this is... 77s that have been decreed. This is divine passive. In other words, God is doing the decreeing. He is the one in charge of history. He is outlining something specific. To decree here means to cut or to determine. It's the only place in the Old Testament this word is used. It's a, it's a very unique word and has the idea of deciding a limited certain period of time cut out for a specific purpose. So what unfolds here is not some indefinite period of time, but a specific, cut out, decided period of time, appropriately, appropriately translated, decreed. Seventy sevens have been decreed. Who is this for? Very clearly in verse 24, for your people and your holy city. A people and a place are designated. This is not general. This is not for all people everywhere. Uh, this is for Daniel's people. This is for the Jews. And it's tied to a place. This is for your holy city. None other than Jerusalem, the resting place of God's special dwelling place. 
Mount Zion, a place of God's love and affection for his people and the very city where God would inhabit the temple. And let's look at this six-fold purpose. The first one listed here in verse 24 is to finish the transgression. To finish means to make a forcible cessation, to bring something to a final end. And transgression is that sin word we looked at in Daniel's prayer, meaning to cross the line. There's the line that God drew. I'm going to go across it with deliberate transgressing. And the purpose that God has for Israel in 77s is to finish that. To bring that transgressing to an end. And then the second statement is to make an end of sin. That is to complete. And, and this word is the word you would use to describe the completing of a letter. Uh, when you finished a letter, you would sign it and you would seal it up. That's the idea. To bring it to its completion. And this here is the common word for sin. The, the word that means to miss the mark. What is going to be done for Israel and for Jerusalem, for the holy city? Making an end of Israel missing the mark. And thirdly, to make atonement for iniquity. To atone is to reconcile, to bring two offended parties together, uh, to bring them as one by way of offering a substitute as payment for offense. This is the common word for covering a sin by a sacrificial substitute. And the word for sin here is iniquity, a perversion, a, a twisting of what was straight. Israel as a nation has missed the mark, crossed the line, and perverted what God made straight. And God says his purpose for them is to bring that to an end, to make an end of that behavior, and even to make atonement, to bring the two parties together. Now, these first three are related. It's all about Israel's sin. And we know the basis for finishing and sealing up and making atonement for transgression, sin, and iniquity could only happen at Calvary. And this was true for Israel. It was Israel's Messiah, according to the flesh, that would come and, and make the, the, the basis for finishing up and making atonement. But the fulfillment of the rebellion coming to an end of bringing to completion their missing the mark, the, the actual enactment of their being reconciled to Messiah, and all of that on a national level, these things have not happened yet. Daniel 9.24 is not historical for us. It is still yet future. These are the purposes God has laid out for Israel and for the holy city, and they have never yet happened. They await the consummation of these 77s in Daniel 9. They await Israel's national repentance. Turn in your Bibles to Zechariah 12.10. If you find Matthew and go back a few pages. You get Zechariah who is a post-exilic prophet. So they've already come back from exile. And Zechariah is still saying this is future. In other words, the exile didn't fulfill the promises. And here's the promise that God gives. Yahweh says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. That is yet to come. This is what Paul describes in Romans chapter 11, 25 to 27, where the Apostle Paul appeals to the new covenant promises of the Old Testament. Familiar places like Jeremiah 31. He quotes that and lists it as still yet future from Paul's day. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. I don't, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, of this mystery, so that you Gentiles will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel, future tense, will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them, that is with Jacob, when I take away their sins. 
from the standpoint of the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God's going to keep his promise to Israel. What Daniel prophesied, what was future to Daniel, was future to Zechariah post-exile, and was future to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament after Messiah came and went. These things still await fulfillment. Notice the next triad of this sixfold purpose for Israel. Fourthly, we have to bring in everlasting righteousness. Israel's Messiah was going to bring in a righteousness that endured, a righteousness for the nation. And so when we think about Messiah, we're not to think only about his first coming. What did Messiah come to do? Yes, he came to lay down his life. And yes, he came to reign in a reign of righteousness that would go from one end of the earth to the other. And he would bring that righteousness for his people Fifth in this sixth-fold purpose, to seal up vision and prophecy. The same word as was used above to seal up sin, to bring it to a completion like a letter at its end being sealed. Here, vision and prophecy are to be rolled up and sealed when finished. That is the end of making prophecy. God's purpose for Israel and for the most holy place was to bring to its end the role of prophecy and vision. And then the sixth aspect of this sixfold purpose was to anoint the most holy place. Uh, to anoint is the word mashach. It sounds like the word uh, mashiach or messiah. And it's the same root word. The, the messiah is in this text. He is the anointed one. And yet at the end of this period of the 77s in Daniel 9, a most holy place, and, and it is a most holy place, it doesn't have the definite article, is to be anointed. And some of your translations might have here the holy of holies, and that would be an appropriate translation. That phrase occurs 39 times in the Old Testament. It is always used either of the tabernacle or the temple or the holy articles in them. It is never used of a person. We don't apply the anointing of the holy place here to Christ. This is the anointing of a literal holy place, a literal temple, a literal future temple. And if you trace out in the Bible the idea of temple or the idea where God makes his dwelling place, we start with the special dwelling place of God in heaven, his throne room. That is where God dwells. And you walk your way into human history and you discover, oh, God made his dwelling with Adam and Eve in the garden. He walked with them in the cool of the day. God dwelt with men on the earth. And then we discover that in the wilderness, God set up a tabernacle so that he could have his special presence with them and, and they would be protected by sacrifice so that he wouldn't incinerate them by his being present with them. And then, of course, you had Solomon's temple was built. That is the uh, place in heaven, Garden of Eden, tabernacle. Now we're on number four, dwelling place of God with men, Solomon's temple. And then you have number five, the Ezra-Nehemiah post-exile rebuilt temple. And then you have number six with Herod's temple just before the time of Christ. And then you have another temple beginning in Acts 2. What is that? The church collective is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God dwells in us. Oh, I left one out from my notes, and I just remembered it. Uh, who tabernacled among us? The word became flesh. Okay, now what number are we on? Seven. <laughs> Uh, the church collective is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And individual Christian, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then number eight, there will be another temple. This will be Antichrist's temple yet to come. There will be a rebuilt temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem that is to be destroyed. And then there is number nine, the Ezekiel temple. Ezekiel 40 to 48 lays out the millennial kingdom temple. That is the one that is described here as one that will be anointed at the end of the 77s in Daniel chapter 9. And then you have the new heavens and new earth where God and the Lamb are the temple, Revelation 21, 22. And so there is no building. And what Daniel describes here in uh, Daniel 9, 24 is number 9 on the list of special dwelling place of God among men. 
And it is what Ezekiel 40 to 48 describes as a rebuilt temple. It doesn't meet the descriptions of any other temple in any, other, any of the other places. It is specific to its measurements, its size, its purpose, its functions, its priesthood, its sacrifices. That is a temple yet to come. And this text tells us that part of God's purpose for Israel is to anoint that most holy place. Let's go back to the opening phrase of verse 24. Seventy sevens have been decreed. These sevens, that is groupings of seven, and there are 70 of them. 70 times seven is what, math class? 490. So there's 490 somethings here. And your English text probably says weeks. That's foreign to the text. The word literally is just seven in Hebrew. There are 77s or 490 somethings. The Jews had in their calendar sevens of things. According to the Hebrew language, a seven of days is what we call a week. But they also had sevens of years. We saw that in the Sabbath year principle. It was designed by God to let the land rest. And after seven sevens of years, that is after 49 years, you had a jubilee where debts would be forgiven, land returned to its original owners, and those kinds of things. And I want you to notice in Daniel chapter 10... Verse 2, a really important phrase for helping us understand that the sevens in Daniel 9 are years. Notice Daniel 10 too. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. You know what the word for weeks here in Hebrew is? Um, sevens of days. Daniel wouldn't need to specify sevens of days in Daniel 10, 2, and 3, which he says twice there, if he hadn't been talking sevens of something else beforehand. And this is the only other place the sevens are found in Daniel. So in Daniel chapter 9, you have 70 sevens of something that will uh, be be years, and we'll see that um, in a moment, contrasted with specified sevens of days when he wants to describe a week in Daniel chapter 10. I want you to consider for a moment the reason for the exile. Again, 490 years of missed Sabbath years. That's a very tangible expression of disobedience to God's law. That resulted in 70 exile years to make up for the Sabbath years missed for the land. Those are coming to an end. Daniel prays, but the nation's not ready yet. The sixfold purpose of God is to make the nation of Israel ready for kingdom and for blessing and Messiah's peaceful reign over the earth from the throne of David in Jerusalem. And what is God's message to Daniel? Hey, when you get out of Babylon and you go back, Messiah's reign starts. No, that's not what he says. 490 more years to fulfill God's purpose for Israel, to prepare them for messianic blessing in the land. 490 years of disobedience, 70 years to make up for Sabbath years missed during that. And now what happens according to God's purpose? 490 more years for Israel to prepare them spiritually for material blessing in a messianic paradise. 490 more years for God to work on Israel. That leads us to point two in the outline this evening. How is God going to help Israel? Let's talk about the time before the Messiah. Verse 25. Look down at verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. So we have these 77s now divided into three parts. In verse 25, we get seven sevens and 62 sevens. How many sevens is that? Seven plus 62 equals 69 sevens. And then in verse 27, we have a remaining seven. That's one seven. 69 sevens plus one seven equals the 77s. So you've got 77s broken up into three groups. One seven, a 62 seven, And a seven, seven. Are you with me? The first 69 sevens are already completed. From our vantage point, they are historical. The last seven is yet to come. Verse 25 details a period of 49 years, seven sevens, and 434 years, 
62 sevens, for a total of 483 years in the 69 sevens. What happens in these 483 years? What happens in the first 49 and then in the next 434? Let's look at these first sevens. Notice what Daniel uh, 9.25 says. From the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Notice the details here. He does not say the rebuilding of the temple. Daniel's very specific. This is the rebuilding of the city. The rebuilding of the city. That becomes important for identifying the date, the start date of the 490 years. And notice what's said here, the restoration and rebuilding. This isn't quick. What would it take to get Jerusalem back to its former state? Not just the walls, not just a dot on the map, not just a geolocation, but uh, clearing out the debris and the trash from a city reduced to rubble. Rebuilding buildings, rebuilding a marketplace and an economy. And notice here that the details are given for a plaza, that's a word for a broad street or a city square, and a moat, literally a trench. Uh, and, and likely the, the ground was dug deeply beneath the front edge of the wall, the outside edges of the wall, to make the walls taller. That's the idea here. All of this would take much time and much work. Now, what is this decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? There are a number of degrees given under the Persian overrule of Israel during this time. The first is from Cyrus in 539 BC, and this was a decree to go to send the captives back and to rebuild the temple. And then Darius reinstituted Cyrus's decree and enforced it. He, he searched it out in 519 to 518 BC. He sent people back and he said, no, they need to keep building the temple. And then Artaxerxes gave a command to Ezra to install the temple furnishings. This was in 457 BC. And not a word is made in any of these about the city. And many people want to place the beginning of Daniel's chronology at these other decrees. And some do so for a number of different purposes, trying to work out schemes. But none of them work. None of them work out to a, a timing of the life of Christ where you make 490 years be literal. And none of them fit the details of the text, that the decree was specific to rebuild the city, not the temple. There's only one decree that fits the description, and it is Artaxerxes' decree. It's found in Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah 2. It occurred in 444 B.C., and it was a, a command to rebuild the city, the gates, the walls, to provide the materials for all these things. And the exact date is given for the issuing of that decree, the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. So we're down to a month and a year when this decree was given. And there were no other Persian decrees uh, available. This date is well attested in ancient history. Uh, March 14th, 444 BC is attested not only by the Hebrew scriptures, uh, not only by what Nehemiah decries, but also what the Persians say and the Greeks say. There is a trifecta of external evidence locating this date. It's one of the best attested dates in ancient history. And here it is as the start date for these 77s. The first seven is given. The first seven of sevens, which is 49 years, tells us that it took about a generation to get Jerusalem put back together. And how is it put back together according to verse 25? Under duress. Notice verse 25, even in times of distress. And you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you understand, uh, hold a sword in one hand, a trowel in the other hand, we're going to try to rebuild the city, and there are enemies all about. And notice verse 25, this decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. So you get the seven weeks, the seven sevens, or 49 years rebuilding Jerusalem, and then there's this other 62 sevens, which take us up to the arrival of Messiah, the Prince. And Messiah is the Hebrew word right here. We're talking about Jesus the Christ and his arrival. When will that take place? According to this text, 483 years after the issuing of the decree by Artaxerxes in 444 BC, 
to rebuild the city. That is a remarkable date in a very specific prophecy. Let's move thirdly this evening to the time of visitation. Verse 26. Then after the 62 sevens, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. In 1881, Sir Robert Anderson worked out the math on the 483 years and compared it to the various calendars that were used in ancient times. This has been more recently updated by Harold Honer, and I would commend his um, book on the Christolog- or, uh, the um, chronological issues related to the life of Christ. And he takes Sir Robert Anderson's math and updates it with a little bit more precision, makes some appropriate corrections, but the framework is still the same. And I want to walk you through it just a little bit. So, um, again, put on your seatbelts, hang on for a second. We need to establish, first of all, how long a year was in the ancient world. And we might call a year here, according to Daniel chapter 9, a prophetic year. I don't know if that's the best label for it. Uh, We've discovered that many ancient calendars held to a 360-day year. But that is exactly the length of time Daniel has in mind here. I want to give you a couple of data points for understanding a year as 360 days. If you go back to Noah's flood in Genesis 7 to 8, we read this in Genesis 7-11. On the 17th day of the second month... And then in 8.4, the 17th day of the seventh month, that's the 150-day period of rainfall. And that is described as five months. So catch this. Five months are described as 150 days in Genesis 7 and 8 with exact dates given. That's 30 days in a month multiplied by 5 is 150 days. How long is a month according to Genesis 7 and 8? 30 days. How many months in a year? 12 months. That gives you 360 days in a year. And when you look at Daniel 7.25 and Daniel 12.7, you get this little phrase given, a time, times, and half a time. That happens to be half of the seven that's described in the final week of Daniel 9.27. What's happening there? Half of seven is three and a half. One time, a dual times, and half a time. One plus two plus a half equals three and a half. That's half of seven. So that works out the same. And then you go to the book of Revelation, and you find out that time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years equals 42 months, which equals 1,260 days, and equals half of a seven. All of those labels are used interchangeably to describe the same thing. What does that mean? That 42 months, 1,260 days, and three and a half years are all the same thing. That all demands a 360-day year. Are you with me? And you say, but yeah, that's not how long a year is. I know how long a year is, 365 days. Is it? No, I'm smarter than a fifth grader. It's 365 and a quarter. That's why we have leap year and stuff. Well, technically, one year is 365.2421987 days. That is 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45.975 seconds. That means that 365 and a quarter doesn't actually work out. There, there's a, there's a, a precision about the earth's rotation around the sun that doesn't quite line up with the earth's spinning on its axis to create a day. And so the ancient world, recognizing this, they they wanted noon to be sun straight up and down, and they wanted the vernal equinox to be at the equal point in the spring and the autumnal equinox to be the equal daylight and darkness point in the fall, and they wanted the shortest day of the year to be here and the longest day of the year. They wanted to keep it all the same. How do you make days that don't quite add up exactly to years work out on a calendar? And the ancient calendars had all kinds of different ways to do this. Something like our leap years, they would add a month every once in a while with some extra days. 
they would make their moon months line up with their sundials, effectively. What do we do? Well, we have leap years. Did you know that century years are not leap years unless they're divisible by the number 400? So we're used to counting leap years by Olympics and U.S. presidential elections. You know, every four years, a leap year, you get an extra day. And if you were born on, what is it, February 29th, then you're, you know, you just got your driver's license and you're only four years old, right? Um, But even that doesn't make up for it because the year 1700 was not a leap year, 1800 was not a leap year, 1900 was not a leap year, the year 2000 was a leap year because it's divisible by 400. Do you see what... None of this works out. How do you figure out Daniel's 360 prophetic years to line up with our modern calendars? Well, others have done the math. 483 multiplied by 360 equals 173,880 days beginning in March of 444 B.C., And if you account for the leap years and the remaining days, hours, minutes, seconds, and fractions of seconds, this puts the end of the 483 prophetic years at March 30th, A.D. 33. And I believe this puts us to the day of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Turn to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah 9.9, we have this prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble, mounted on a donkey. Even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Look at Psalm 118.26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. We have blessed you from the house of Yahweh. Now turn to Luke 19. In Luke 19, Jesus is telling a parable, a parable about an exacting master, a king, And this is one who demands back what he has lent out to his slaves. But this really is a parable of Israel's failed stewardship of God's truth and promises. We won't go through the parable, but look down at verse 27. Jesus sums up the parable with this remarkable statement. These enemies of mine, and he's talking about his own nation. He came into his own and his own received him not. These enemies of mine who, look at this, did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. So Jesus tells this parable about the squandering of resources, and he sums it up by saying, these are my enemies, and they didn't want me, the rightful king, to reign over them. And notice verse 28 of Luke 19. After he had said these things, right after that parable, right after that summary statement, they don't want me to reign over them as king. He was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. He approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet. He sent two of his disciples, go to the village. There's a colt, get it. If anyone asks you, the Lord needs it. They sent word, they found it just as he said. Why are you untying the colt? The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their coats on the colt. They put Jesus on it. Verse 36, as he was going... They were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. So we got the Zechariah 9-9 fulfillment, Messiah the King coming on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And now we get Psalm 118 that we just read, sung, shouted by the crowd, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they cried out, Peace in heaven. And glory in the highest. This is a remarkable scene. Look at verse 39. The Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said, If they're quiet, the stones will sing Psalm 118. What an amazing scene. 
Think about what it means up until this point. Demons have said, I know who you are, son of David. Shh. Jesus would heal people and he said, don't tell him. Jesus even told his disciples, save these things till after I'm risen from the dead. Everything was hush, hush, hush about who he was and what he came to do until this moment. And the crowds cry out and the Pharisees are perturbed. And Jesus said, look, this is the time. This is when people identify the king as the son of David, as the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, entering Jerusalem. This is the time to say it. And if they don't say it, the rocks will. From silence about his identity to out and out loud projection of the truth. Listen, it's, it's like the inevitable reality that Pilate would put king of the Jews as a label on top of the cross. You know, the Pharisees again, no, no, don't put that up there. Put up there that he said he was king of the Jews. No, I've written what I've written. God's inexorable, inevitable, sovereign plan is coming to the fore. Even in the details of a crowd that would be fickle and four days later would crucify him and cry out for his murder. Here in this moment, on this day, they are saying, King, and he's come to Jerusalem. This is a remarkable scene. Look at verse 41. When Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Why is Jesus weeping? This is the triumphal entry. This is the recognition. Because Jesus knows He says, verse 42, if you, Jerusalem, had known in this day, even you, the things which were made for your peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. This is judicial hardening for a people promised great blessings from God who are not yet spiritually prepared for it. Why? Because only 483 out of the 490 years have happened. The king came. And they did not want him to reign over them. Look at verse 43. Jesus said, The days will come upon you now when your enemies will throw up a barricade, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground and your children with you. They will not leave on you one stone upon another because you did not recognize, and listen to this phrase, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That is 483 years from Nehemiah 2, according to Daniel chapter 9. Four days after this, Messiah was cut off. It's exactly what Daniel says. Look back at Daniel chapter 9. After the 62 sevens, Messiah will be cut off. And he will have nothing. What does this mean? It means Messiah doesn't have his kingdom. Messiah isn't seated on the throne of David. Messiah doesn't have a rod of iron ruling the nations, Psalm 2. He is not fulfilling the messianic kingly reign, Psalm 110, over all the earth that is promised for Messiah. He is cut off, killed, and left with nothing. And then what happens? The city and the sanctuary are destroyed. Who will do this? Again, look at the details. Who destroys the city and the sanctuary? The people of the prince who is to come. That's not the people of the prince Messiah. He came and was cut off. Who destroys the city and the temple? The people of another prince, a second prince, a coming prince. Who's this coming prince? Notice it's not the coming prince that destroys the city and the sanctuary. It's the people of the prince who will come. This is amazing. This gets us really specific. We know who destroyed the temple and the city. It was the Romans. Under General Titus Vespasian in AD 70. Laid waste to the city. Crucified thousands in a day. Removed every stone off the temple mount. So what was left is just a flat stove pavement that is still flat to this day. Except it's got a giant mosque on the top called the Dome of the Rock. 
By the way, just a couple of weeks ago, some rabbis were up there and they were run off the temple complex being uh, stoned by Muslim women and Muslim men and then they were run off by the temple complex police. What were these Jewish rabbis doing on the temple mount? Uh, They were taking uh, just branches and they were whacking these branches on the stone pavement. They were trying to skirt the no Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount law that the Muslims have instilled. And so they said, well, we can't say our prayers. Maybe we'll just beat them with sticks into the pavement. And they got stoned and run off the Temple Mount. Look, the the, the destruction of Jerusalem and the evidence of the clearing off of the Temple, not one stone left upon another, is evident still to this day. And and who did that? It was the Romans. The final squash of the Jewish rebellion in Palestine under Roman rule in AD 70. Vespasian's army flooded into Jerusalem, crucified thousands in a day, demolished the city, and obliterated the temple. And notice the gap. We talked about this last time. The gap between the 69th and the 70th, 7. Right? There are events that happen. These are not linear like 7, the 69th, 7 happens, and then the 70th, 7 happens. No, there's clearly a gap here in this text because Messiah gets cut off and then about four decades later, the city is destroyed. Um, There's no way to make the 70th seven of Daniel happen right after the 69th. There's clearly a break. Significant events that happen. Notice what takes place between Messiah cut off, Jerusalem destroyed, the sanctuary demolished, and then this really long, enduring thing called war and desolations, plural. And what has been the lot of the city of Jerusalem, the the land of Israel, and the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years? Wars and desolations. So, so far we have 483 years of God's dealing with Israel to get to that six-fold purpose. Seven more years to go, and these seven years are still to come. That leads us, number four, to the time of the Antichrist. It must be the time of the Antichrist because we're already out of time. We can't save this for next time. We're just going to keep going. If you need to leave, you can leave. We're just going to finish. Read verse 27 with me. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. This last seven, this one group of seven years, the first 69 were very literal. They were fulfilled to the day, fulfilled to the letter. This last group of seven years must also be taken literally. This corresponds in your Bible to Deuteronomy 4, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 24, Jeremiah 30, Ezekiel 20, Daniel 7, 9, 11, and 12, Joel 2 and 3, Amos, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi 4. It is called a time of trouble, Jacob's distress. This is judgment and salvation for Israel. This is what Jesus describes two whole chapters in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13 and 14, Luke 17 and 21. Paul describes it in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, and of course the entirety of Revelation. 6 through 19 details this last seven. This is all over your Bible. These last seven years leading up to Messiah's reign on the earth will be the worst period of human history ever. And notice what marks the beginning of Daniel's 70th 7, verse 27. He will make a firm covenant with the many for a week. Antichrist will make a firm, a strong covenant, a strong convincing treaty Uh, By the way, if you were wondering, the rapture does not begin the 70th week of Daniel. What begins the 70th week of Daniel according to this text? Antichrist's treaty, literally with the many. That is, not everybody will agree that it's a good idea. And this is a treaty for one seven, one seven year period of time. Uh, It seems to me that this would be a treaty between Israel and the nations, some sort of non-aggression pact perhaps, something that would allow Israel access to the Temple Mount to reinstate sacrifices, because in this very verse, those sacrifices get stopped. If you're going to have sacrifices get stopped, they have to get started. If sacrifices in Israel are going to get started, they have to happen on the Temple Mount, and they have to happen in the Temple, according to the prescriptions of Jewish law. And it would be easy to see how that kind of non-aggression pact would be appealing in our day. Someone finally solved the Middle East crisis. How did they do that? 
How would one ever get the Muslim world to relinquish the Dome of the Rock, which sits on the Temple Mount of Jerusalem right now? But notice in the middle, what's the middle of a seven? Three and a half, again, time, times, and half a time, 1260 days, 42 months, all that same math. What happens? He breaks the treaty. In the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come the desolator, literally in the Hebrew text. This wing of abominations, a, a wing on a bird is its extremity, it's its outward uh, part, uh, likely, the, and this is, a, this is a phrase that's debated, uh, so I'm only going to give my guess at this. I think he's talking about the extremity of abominations, the greatness of abominable wickedness. And when he does that, he will lay waste to worship and to the city. He'll make it desolate. Jesus refers to this in Matthew 24, 15. He makes it clear that from Jesus' vantage point, this event of Daniel 9, 27 was still future in Jesus' day. That means that this event cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 BC. It also means this event cannot be Titus Vespasian in 70 AD, even though he laid waste to Herod's temple in that day. Why? Because he, uh, this one, this, an, this Antichrist figure here is said to desolate the temple with abominations and then will be completely destroyed. The book of Revelation, by the way, was written 25 years after the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 and still has these events of Daniel 9.27 in the future. So there's no historical event, no historical character that fits this description yet. This is still one into the future. He is called in Daniel 7 the horn. In Daniel 11, 36 and 37, he is described there again. Paul calls him the man of lawlessness. John calls him the antichrist. In the book of Revelation, he is called the beast. And here in Daniel 9, he is called the desolator or one who makes desolate. And that desolator, according to this verse, will be utterly destroyed. Scott Demarest described this a couple of weeks ago in Revelation 19. This, of course, ushers in Messiah's thousand-year reign on the earth. What is God's answer to Daniel's prayer? Will my people be ready to inherit messianic blessing in the land when we get back from exile? And God's answer to that is no. They're not ready. 490 years are required to get Israel ready. And there's going to be a gap in those 490 years where God is up to something else by His grace to bring people from outside the cultivated olive grove, us wild olive branches, and graft us into the rich root of the olive tree and benefit from the blessings and promises of Israel's Messiah. That's why we're here. Because of God's grace to Gentiles. I want to think through just a, a couple of important uh, sort of takeaways here. For eschatology systems, Daniel 9, 24 to 27 disallows ah millennialism. The idea that we are in the kingdom now goes against Messiah being cut off and having nothing. This isn't the kingdom. The kingdom didn't start at Jesus' first kingdom and Daniel 9, 24 to 7 also disallows post-millennialism. There is not a rebuilding of the kingdom by our efforts to usher in Christ's return. No, Christ comes back and establishes his kingdom. And also, there's no crazy TBN, ultra-dispensational timing predictions allowable by this text. You can't go out there and, and start saying, I know when Jesus is going to come back and get a following after yourself, write a book, sell a bunch of copies, and then watch that date come and go, then write another book and sell a bunch more copies with another date. You can't do that stuff. It's very clear that we cannot now predict the date of Messiah's return. And nobody can until the 70th seven begins. Then there's a clock. In fact, Daniel talks about those who are wise during that time who will be able to pay attention to signs and work out the timing. But this gap in between week 69 and week 7, uh, between the 69th 7 and the 70th 7, this gap is of unknown duration. That's the gap we're in. We can't know. Somebody tells you they know when Christ is coming back, run the other direction. 
By the way, Matthew 24 and 25 gives specific directions to those saints who will be there during that time and tells them what to do. And so that's just a reminder, like all sections of eschatology in our Bible, these things have practical import. We would call this ethical eschatology. And you just watch it. When the Bible gives you details about the future, watch what comes next. There's a therefore. How do I live now in light of that? Let's think for us a couple of takeaways. God's answers to our prayers might not be what we expect or what we wish for, but they are perfect. He's sovereign, he's good, he's writing history, and he knows what he's doing. Daniel's prayer. Deuteronomy and Isaiah and Jeremiah 30, is it all going to intersect? Are we actually going to obey you and get rid of idolatry and welcome in messianic blessing? No. 490 years. I'm going to work on Israel, and I'm going to prepare them for that very thing. may not be what we expect, but it's perfect. We learn, of course, from this passage the trustworthiness of the Bible. Down to the letter, down to the detail, the details matter, and Daniel gave us the date of Messiah's arrival. Do you know what that means? Um, We can look at the details in predictive prophecy and believe them. This leads us also to the trustworthiness of God's promises. If God makes a promise to Israel, in spite of appearances, we might have lived in John Owen's day and said, well, there is no such thing as Israel. I said, well, I guess God's done with that. We might have lived in J.C. Ryle's day and said, well, there is no such thing as Israel, but God made a promise, so I'm going to believe it. And you think about Ezekiel's vision of dry bones where God put the bones and the sinews together and raised life out of a a skeleton closet of people. We would believe God's promises. By the way, if you disbelieve God's promises to Israel, read Romans 9 to 11, then, then we would conclude that God's word has failed and therefore you can't believe the wonderful promises to Christians in Romans 8. There's a connection between Romans 8 and the great promises there and God's dealings with Israel in the future, Romans 9 to 11. Daniel said there would be war and desolations up until the end. What does that mean for us? Where do we place our hope? Sovereignty of God to work out all of human history. Not in the next political movement. Not in the overthrow of one government and the start of a new, uh, wonderful, perfect society somewhere. If you've looked at the decline in our nation and thought, okay, where's the next Mayflower and where am I going to go? And we're going to set up the perfect little place. It's not happening. Until the end, there will be war and there will be desolations. Our hope is in Christ's coming kingdom. And that leads us to a very practical outworking. We pray. And what do we pray? Kingdom come. Or as a friend of mine, Doug Searle, said, apocalypse now. And just a reminder, ethical eschatology, thinking about future things, thinking about God keeping his promises, believing it down to the detail, always should induce us to live righter, to live better, to live gooder, to live more godly, to live with an eternal perspective, to dislodge our attachment to idols, to love his purposes, to live for his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, remarkable set of verses, for its exquisite details, for the confidence that your word gives us in what you have already accomplished and what you promise to accomplish in the future. And we know this world will get worse before it gets better, but when it gets better, oh, it will be so good. We pray, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And to you be the glory now and forevermore. Amen.